Hi, welcome to my podcast, Stories by Vera V. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest by the name of... Feliska, hello. And we'll be discussing what's it like being a composer and pianist. Interesting stories by interesting people. Stories by Vera V. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, right. So I'm a... Obviously, as I said before, my name is Rebecca Scarf. I'm a student at Leeds Conservatoire. I'm a I'm primarily a pianist, close to classical music, but I'm also a composer. I write a lot of my own works, which gives me what I like to be very unique insight into music and the creative process. Mm-hmm. So to start yeah. off, I think once I posted something on my story about how I started playing piano when I was 13. So if you're comfortable sharing, you said that you started when you were 15, right? Yes, I did. So my, my story with music is interesting. I, the very earliest experience I have with music is I was able to copy something. So my, so my sister used to have this to start with when she was around 14, 13. So I would have been, 11, 12, maybe even younger. And the very first experience I had was she learned to pick. And then after her lesson, I went down and was able to pick it out by ear. Uh-huh. Whilst just whilst listening to it. And then many, many, many years later, I actually started doing GCSE music mm-hmm. at my secondary school. And I initially started doing that as a singer. I was a singer in a band. However, it was during the summer between year 10 and year 11, so we're talking 2017, I actually realized that I had quite a knack for classical music. Mm-hmm. So I started, getting, I started getting proper lessons, and from there, I just snowballed in terms of progress. Mm-hmm. And it was, in, it was in the summer of 2018, which was only about a year and a half later, um, where I actually really, where I actually really thought about music. Because initially, for doing music, I wanted to be a physicist. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted, I wanted to be a physicist, which I now know I'm not nearly clever enough to do. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, it was, I was sat, I had just, I just dropped my sister off at university, and I'd been thinking about what, where I wanted to go. Because university, it was still a long way off. Mm. But it was, it got me thinking. So, and I was thinking, and I was thinking how I didn't really want to do physics. I was really, really into my music. And it was that very day I decided, okay, I want to be a performer. I want to compose my own things. Oh my and everything gosh. I've done since then has just been, um, has just come from that. Mm-hmm. That's very interesting. But what do you mean having a knack for classical music? Could you expand on that? It just, it, Playing in that style came to me very, very easily. Like the very first, the very first piece of classical music I learned, which is very serious, was the first movement of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Everyone knows mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. But then, but then I learned the I learned the third movement not very well. There is one recording of me playing it, and <laughs> I absolutely, I absolutely despise it. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> I remember I learned that piece out of spite because my teacher said I couldn't. Mm-hmm. My, teacher, my teacher said I wouldn't be able. My teacher said I wouldn't be able to learn it, so I learned it out of spite. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. as a consequence of me playing it really badly in the past, I can't listen to that piece anymore. I don't like really? it. Really? Just messed yeah. it up for yourself? <laughs> I've I've ruined I've ruined it for myself. Yeah, uh-huh. definitely. Uh huh. Do you feel like you're skilled in? So obviously, like memorizing notes, I would assume. But do you have perfect pitch or anything? Oh no, I do not have perfect pitch. My, yeah. I'm trying to improve my um, uh, my ear training. I'm sorry, my brain does this thing where it just completely forgets. What I'm going to say. It's okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm trying to improve my ear training. You do that by a little bit every day. So it's 20 minutes, half an hour every single day. Mm. And now, I mean, I'm I'm far better than I was last year. But it's still not at the point where it's still not at the level where I want it to be. It's just gradual improvements, mm-hmm. stuff like that. But perfect, perfect pitch, definitely not. Uh huh. And so, when did you start composing? I started writing pretty much at the same time I started playing. 
The very first thing I wrote was in, I wrote it in February, February 2000, yeah, February 2017, Mm -hmm. after I've been having piano lessons for about about two months. So I started having piano lessons in December 2016. Mm -hmm. And it's a very... It's very inter- it's a very interesting piece. It does not follow standard harmonic rules, mm-hmm. and obviously, it's very very poor. <laughs> but it was it was but it was just me experimenting with the type of music that I could write, and it's similar to it's still it's similar to my process because I could hear what I wanted my music to sound like, in my head. I could hear what I wanted it to be, mm-hmm. but I couldn't figure out how to write it that. Uh-huh. And this is why my ear training needs to improve because as my ear training improves that ability to write stuff down instantly will get better Mm -hmm. and I think I could I got something silly like a a winter night or something and it was just a very slow very ponderous very boring piece of music Uh uh-huh what was it based on is there like another piece of music that inspired it not particularly at least not I can remember a lot of my conversations are inspired by other pieces of music and my own take on those ideas. And that's that was sort of how how my best conversations sort of bleed through. But not that first one, not that I can remember. I think I might have been trying to be too original, mm-hmm. which never works. <laughs> Do you still play it from time to time when you're bored or something? <laughs> no, the book is somewhere somewhere back at my proper house when I'm away from uni it's somewhere on a bookshelf there Mm. somewhere in a book that's completely full of other better things I know how long did it take you to write the first one about three days Uh uh-huh okay that's not too long no it's not too long it's not it wasn't it was not particularly long piece either it was only about two minutes at most Mm. do you write a whole lot now not as much as I'd like to I'm too busy with the practical side of my university course because that is what I'm here to study I do the composition as it's it's what I do for fun it's a hobby so I don't get to do it as much as I want to especially not recently when there's a at least at the time of recording there's a competition in two weeks oh, which, wow. I've been which I've been practicing like crazy for uh-huh. yeah so I haven't, been, I haven't been able to write as much as I want to, but definitely during, over Christmas and over the summer, I write a lot more. Mm-hmm. I intend to, I intend, there's a few things I need to finish, such as a piano trio, which is a chamber, chamber piece for piano, cello and violin. Mm-hmm. And I've written two movements of one that have been, and that have been sat untouched on my shelf for a year now. A year. <laughs> I need to finish it. <laughs> uh-huh. It's just as I'm with my own, I know with my own compositions, I'm incredibly self-critical. Mm-hmm. Like 90% of what I start, I will delete within the first half hour. 9% <laughs> of what I ca- 9% of what I carry on, I will never finish. And then only 1% of what I ever start will actually be finished. Uh-huh. That's very interesting. Yeah. Mm. How about you? Because I've seen that you write your own songs and stuff like that. Is there a similar process for me? I don't finish like most of it. (laughs) I finish maybe out of everything like 5%. (laughs) Mm. So yeah. But when you compose, you said that you hear it in your head first, right? Mm -hmm. Do you just sit down and kind of let, you know, whatever it is come out or do you do it based off inspiration? Uh, it, it really it really depends. Sometimes when I'm doing something that's new, in a new style, such as um, I did a big piece of orchestral music last year for an assignment, mm-hmm. which was I had to. It was a free it was a free composition, and I did a I did a sort of tone poem based off an extract from the Prelude by William by William Wordsworth. Mm-hmm. Which is a sort of a, it's a little extract of a boy stealing a boat and then getting intimidated by the fact that he's in the middle of a lake in nature, very mm-hmm. scary things in the dark. So I did some I did something based off 
that. And because of the sheer scale of the instrumentation I was working with, I had to base it off lots of different things. There's lots of Tchaikovsky inspiration. There's lots of Mendelssohn in that mm-hmm. piece. But when, if I'm just sat on my own with a genre that I'm more comfortable with, such as solo piano work, stuff like that, I can usually just start writing that straight away. Mm-hmm. And I can try and make it feel more original and more me, as it were. Uh-huh. That's the hardest part in composition, especially nowadays with the rise of avant-garde and contemporary music, having your own voice be heard in a way that you still wanted to, that you wanted to get. It's so difficult, so important. Mm-hmm. When you write it down, if I gave you like a sheet of music right now, could you sound it out in your head? Like just read it? Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, um, reading, reading stuff at sites, it's, so yeah, it's something that I can do. Mm-hmm. Um, it's easy. It's easier when it's a composition in my head because I know exactly how it sounds in my head first before I write it down and then I can read it back. Uh, with completely new pieces of music, um, it gets harder. For single melody lines, I can do that definitely. For things where you've got chords added in, it gets harder. Mm-hmm. And if you if you gave me like a big orchestral book, I'd be completely lost. Mm-hmm. But with compositions, when it kind of comes to you, does it just come as music or do you see certain things along with it, like imagery or? I'm, I've never, I'm not sure whether this is actually a part of my upbringing as a musician, but I don't associate music that I compose with imagery very much. Mm-hmm. At least not actively. It comes retroactively. I'll write it out. I will hear it. I'll play it. And then I'll get images from it. I never get images before. I never start off with, oh, I want to portray this in a way. Uh-huh. And I tried, I tried and failed at that whilst doing something else. I, tried, I was writing a piano piece and I tried to get it to sound like uh, a sort of snowy day with snow gently falling. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like and I just couldn't get it to sound right. Mm-hmm. But then a few weeks later, I was just improvising on the piano. I was like, oh, this is sort of what I wanted. Oh. So I uh-huh. can't I can't create I can't create that sort of imagery on demand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How big of a role do you feel emotion plays into it? Oh, emotion plays an ma- absolutely massive role. Mm-hmm. Depending on depending on what I'm feeling and stuff like that, it has a, it has a massive impact in how, I've, in how I compose. So one of the compositions that's available on my YouTube channel, of which there's only a handful, is a nocturne, which is a night piece. It's supposed to be very soft, very delicate. Mm-hmm. And that was written when I was in a very particular, when I was in a very particular state. And the impact of what that does come clear through the music, especially with in the middle section, I modulate from A flat major to C minor rather rather quite suddenly, mm-hmm. which which is quite it's quite a dark turn to yeah. the music. And then whilst the first part of the, of the music has quite a repetitive melody, it's quite got it's got nice pleasant kind of flowing parts to it, especially in the higher voice. This, the next part is very slow, it's very somber. You've got a lot of very muddy uh, trills in the left hand, right at the bottom register of the piano. Mm. And it's very loud, it's very strong. And that sort of emotion registers. And it, it, I, I like to think it comes through. And that helps portray the story that every piece of music is trying to tell. Because all music has a narrative, whether you're playing it or writing it. Mm. or anything all music has to have a narrative that you're following yeah like a story <clears throat> do you ever channel your emotions like when I don't know if you're feeling because that's kind of what I do when I'm feeling sad I just write about it and then that way I'm not sad anymore but it also like you <clears throat> said it also reads through it yeah I I improvise a lot when I'm if I'm feeling if I'm feeling down I imp- I'll improvise a lot mm. And if I'm, if I'm feeling happy, I'll improvise around that. If it's something particularly dramatic or 
angry or these strong thoughts or sort of repeated notes, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Whatever, whatever you're feeling massively impacts what you're writing, as it were. So the difference between the improvisation side of it and a finished composition, particularly for composing classical music, is very, very different. Mm-hmm. Unless you unless you are a complete and utter genius like Mozart and Beethoven were, mm-hmm. it's very very rare that what you hear initially in your head is what's going to be the final product. It will go mm-hmm. through hundreds and hundreds of changes, and you'll have to apply music theory to it and stuff like that. So one concept I'm trying to learn more of now is the concept of counterpoint. Oh yeah, which yeah, is, yeah. Yeah, do two melody lines at the same time and how they're supposed to interact on a repeat and melodically and i'm reading a book about it called um by by um oh i can't remember his first name his last name is fux f-u-x uh-huh. and it's called gratis ad Panasen. and it's a it's a little textbook which all the great composers for the last 400 years have studied every <laughs> single one of them used that book and it's it's fa- it's fascinating the way the book is actually written it's written as if it was a transcript between a teacher and a student. Mm-hmm. So it's literally got things such as, oh, good morning, student. Like, hi, hello. I filled out these, I filled out these exercises that you gave me, which were in the last chapter, which the person who's reading the book should have filled in. And the teacher then goes through and there's supplied answers which could possibly be correct. But then it explains why, ah, you're probably going to make this mistake here. This is why this is incorrect. It's really, really interesting stuff like that, but it's so complicated. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> mm. How long do you think it's going to take you to study it completely? Oh, a, a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the, it's the sort of thing, there are, there are composers that never mastered counterpoint. Mm-hmm. They just, they never, they never did it. The best counterpoint, the best contrapuntal composer was Bach, Johann Sebastian yeah. Bach. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, yeah. He undoubtedly was the best, but there are other composers like Schubert and uh, Tchaikovsky and uh, who's the other one? I want to say Wagner. Maybe maybe Wagner less so. They didn't mm. master counterpoint as intensely or as intrinsically. Uh, my go-to example for this is Schubert, mm. such as like Schubert wrote Schubert, Schubert was very famous for his leader. German songs and those are absolutely fantastic he was well known for his chamber music but s- stuff like his chamber music I find very shallow because there's no depth to it it's the passing around of one melody but it's always in a sort of very weak canon you never get mm-hmm. true polyphony from it mm-hmm. and it's just from my, from my point of view I get into I get into arguments with this about <laughs> this with the other pianists I cannot stand Schubert's solo piano music because uh-huh. it's, just, it's I just find it really boring. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So would you say you're a fan of polyphony then? Yes, I am a fan of polyphony. It's so hard to play. Mm-hmm. Learning a learning a proper bar fugue. So I'm so at the, so my teacher last week gave me a the first movement of Beethoven sonata to learn, and I was able to learn a third of it in a week. I've been playing a Bach fugue for three months, and I'm still on the first page. Oh my gosh! <laughs> it, it, it's so it's so dense, mm-hmm. and you have to know exactly what's going on in each of the voices, and it's so com- and it's so complex. It's why it's why Bach is one of the hardest composers to play, mm-hmm. especially to read and understand. Mm-hmm. Regarding c- counterpoint, didn't he make up like half of those rules? I wouldn't say he made up the rules. The rules were of his time were very well established, but he definitely defined them and made them clear. Yeah. And then he also broke a lot of them. Mm-hmm. It's, really, it's really interesting. So a lot of A-level musicians, well, most of them will do what are called Bach chorales, where you learn the fundamentals of uh, harmony and voice leading. Now, Bach chorale is a sort of, it's a sort of precursor to true counterpoint. And in those chorales, you're given a soprano melody line. You have to fill in uh, alto, tenor, and bass, mm-hmm. whilst maintaining uh, harmonic consistency, flow, modulation, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And there was a really interesting example I remember where there was a very rare case where the soprano line repeated a note twice. 
and that was very very rare mm-hmm. and it was especially rare because it was on a cadence which is the which is a musical full okay. stop mm-hmm. phrase and so we we fit we completed it my classmates completed it as we thought was correct we handed mm-hmm. it in and the teacher said yes that's technically correct but then the teacher got out the actual bark chorale because each bark chorale is just taken from one line of something that he'd already written so there was an actual version that bark had written and he broke and he breaks every single one of his rules in writing that particular chorale and it was infuriating uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> because we, we spent so long scratching our head over this going well we clearly can't use that chord because that would break this rule we can't do that because that would break this rule mm-hmm. and then it just gets completely ignored and it's really annoying uh-huh do you break a whole lot of rules when you're composing your own things? Uh, probably ones that I'm not even aware of. Mm-hmm. There's some rules that I definitely try not to break, such as when you're writing for an orchestra, if you're ever writing for a big orchestra uh, and you're voicing out a full chord, you, genuinely, you generally only have one third per section of the orchestra. Mm-hmm. So one third in the winds, brass, string, whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's because if you have too many thirds, it makes, it makes the chord sound too clustered. Mm-hmm. And there's other ones such as how you have the dynamics of the orchestra interact, for example. You wouldn't have the, you would, you need to try and find the balance between the instruments and the orchestra. So mm-hmm. it's no point having a melody line for piano and flute if you're having the brass blast out 14 chords along with it. Mm-hmm. And then there's all sorts of other rules in terms of parallel motion and movement yeah. to octaves and harmonic stuff like that, which I I try to avoid, but if it happens, it's not the end of the world for me, as long as it's still what I wanted mm-hmm. in my head. Okay. And when you write those pieces, do you hear the orchestra in full? before you write it down or is it just like the piano and then you expand it? Uh, it depends. Sometimes I do hear um, orchestral, like I, I won't, I won't, I will hear like an orchestral statement. Mm-hmm. So I will hear, I will hear a melody or a theme or something going on in orchestra. But in order to understand it, I have to condense it down to piano first. So I've definitely got it right. Yeah. So I've got all, so I've got all the moving parts down and then once I've got that right, I can then transfer I can then put it back to the orchestra. Mm-hmm. There's a as a player, and I go I got into a discussion with a friend last night about this. I generally, whenever I'm playing piano and I'm playing other pieces, I generally hear an orchestra in my head. I try to imitate that uh-huh. when I'm playing piano. But what my friend was saying he disagrees. He says that he hears a choir in his head whenever he plays, <laughs> and he tries to imitate that. Uh huh. I think that that comes that comes across quite a lot when we play. So I'm playing a very the, yeah, the Beethoven sonata I'm playing opens a very strong theme. It's da, 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 da. And I always, I always imagined that as the very as a very loud brass opening. So you got mm-hmm. horns and trumpets blasting out that strong opening, and then the very soft reply is done by the woodwinds. Mm-hmm. He disagrees. He thinks that it should be a sort of a far more understated and make it link up more. Because mm-hmm. I like to emphasize, I like to emphasize silence mm-hmm. in those in those sorts of moments. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Because you said that you started with singing, right? I started singing, but I did. I didn't do classical singing. Mm. I was. I. I sang a. I sang a sort of. I sang a rock band. Oh, wow. those videos, there's videos floating around of me doing of me doing that. <laughs> <and like that. laughs> but he he sang in a he sang in a proper church choir and he sang all sorts of very impressive repertoire. Mm-hmm. And that was his that was his introduction to music, as it were. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that that difference, I think, yeah, as I said, it, it comes through very well. But it also links it in some way because you have pianists who just play and they just hear the piano. Mm-hmm. And I think I can you can tell whenever you get whenever you hear a pianist like that because it's just sort of very flat and uninspired. Uh-huh. It's very interesting. So usually when yeah. you're listening to like a performance, 
you can clearly tell the difference? You can tell the difference if someone is trying to imitate other instruments or they're trying to voice things in a way in which it has that sort of effect. Uh-huh. And this is what most of the this is what most of my lessons like can so are about. Because as much as there is good technique and all oh, you can play these scales really fast, at the end of the day, if I was to just focus on all that scaling work, I could do all that in a year. Mm-hmm. the real reason I'm here is it's all about interpretation it's all about voicing it's all about phrasing and that stuff's far far harder yeah than any than any technical thing uh-huh. so even if you look at the uh, the hardest pieces that uh, that have been written for piano so a famous uh, a famous example is the Flight of the Bumblebee mm-hmm. that's transcribed, oh, yeah. Rach- transcribed by Rachmaninoff it's incredibly fast scales all over the place but the hardest part is where does the melody come in where does the Mm. tone go how do you change the color of the music as it's being played Uh because if you wanted to hear a note accurate rendition that's got no song you could just play it in Sibelius or something Mm -hmm. (laughs) but that's but that's that's not what people want to hear they're there to hear the color of the music and the soul of it Uh it's it's why it's why the world world record for like fastest instrument playing annoys me. Mm, oh <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's complete. It's completely useless in regards to actually developing a nice sound to play with. Mm. Because yeah, it's all very well impressive. Oh look, you can play very fast, but no one's going to want to come back and hear you play something that's meaningful. They think that all you can do is just play fast. Mm-hmm. You need to be able to play meaningful pieces you need to be able to play with everything that you have all at one in order to truly get your message across and that is how audiences fall in love with music and with the with the performance playing uh-huh. it's because even even a completely musically illiterate audience people who don't know a thing about music uh-huh. they will be able to tell whether a performer has their soul into the music because it's it the difference is night and day Mm -hmm. that's very interesting I know I definitely agree with you on the emphasis on speed because I saw this one kid I don't know where but he was doing flight of the bumblebee I think two times the speed or something (laughs) have you seen that (laughs) that's crazy yeah but I don't think he focused too much or he could even focus on distinguishing the voices and really making Mm -hmm. the melody shine through because it's just so fast yeah and you get you you get a lot of that in um, a lot of the piano competitions around the world, the, the very big famous piano competitions, like the Tchaikovsky competition, the Van Cliven competition in America, and most famously and most recently the Chopin competition. Mm-hmm. And again, I and again I got into some fight, I got into the fight with some of the other piano students because there was this there's this one etude where the entire point of the etude is you're strengthening these fingers here. And you're strengthening them by playing a chromatic scale with them. So you are basically going through like that. Yeah. <laughs> for, about, for about two minutes, just up and down, whilst you're playing chords. And there's still a melody to that. The melody is in the left hand. So, uh, 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 uh. But whenever you heard people play that piece in the competition, you couldn't hear that. Mm. It was all about the chromatic scale, which yeah. if you're showing off for the technical skill, yeah, great go you, but it's not nice to listen to. If mm-hmm. I wanted to listen to someone play a chromatic scale, I can just play a chromatic scale. <laughs> I'm, I'm there for the interpretation of the melody and how that relates to the chromatic scale. Because the mm-hmm. best performances of that piece, the melody, the left hand is incredibly loud, the right hand is really very quiet. Mm-hmm. And it's all, about, it's all about the left hand. Mm-hmm. And you get, a, you get a similar problem with the, the very famous Winds to Wind Etude, mm-hmm. which is famous for the very slow. And it, it, it explodes with lots of right hand movement. Uh-huh. And again, you have far too many people playing that right hand far too loudly when the melody goes in the left hand. It's supposed to be very, very powerful. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I genuinely do not understand why music has turned to that direction. It's, really, it's it's quite it's quite saddening. Uh-huh. 
Mm. Yeah, I feel like it's more of a party trick. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Definitely. There's a, it's, it's people who play as a party trick. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with playing to show off. But I think there's, there are certain pieces which are better suited for that. And those Chopin pieces are not those, are not suited to showing off. Yeah. Good pieces to show off with are Liszt's Hungarian Rhapsodies. <laughs> the, very, the very famous one. Da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. Those pieces get very technically challenging and they're meant to, they're meant to show off. They're, they're, that's what they're for. He wrote them as show off pieces to show, look how good I am compared to the rest of the people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if you have the technique to show off, great, do it. But don't show off at the expense of the soul of the music. Mm-hmm. Never, de- never develop an incredible technique just for the sake of the technique if nothing else comes with it. Uh-huh. Yeah. I feel like those differences are pretty minuscule to the regular ear. And also, I don't think anybody, like not a whole lot of people could do what you do, I'm pretty sure. I think you'd be, su- I think you'd be surprised. A lot of people when they listen to a concert, they know whether they like the pianist or not. Mm. They know whether there's something to the music that they like. Yeah. Uh, the, best exa- the best example of this was recently at the Leeds International Piano Competition. I went to see the finals of that. Mm. And the, the, winner of the, co- the winner of the competition played. She played absolutely fantastic. It was technically perfect. And it was very, very good musically. But then the next person to come on from the very first notes, there was something very different about it, something that I really liked, something that a lot of other people liked as well. And talking with people in the audience afterwards, they were very much saying, oh, yes, this person was technically better, but I preferred this person's performance. Mm -hmm. So they were saying that they would pay to see the second guy's performance before they go to see the other guy again. Mm -hmm. So even audiences that aren't that interested in music they know the difference Mm -hmm. even if it's just something deep and instinctual Mm -hmm. that's very that's fascinating but Mm. what is it specifically about the sound is it just the quality or the way it rings that that is that is the question that i am trying to answer and i'm trying to put forth in my music like i spent i'm learning a the conversation i'm learning a mendelssohn song without words Mm. It's a solo piano piece. It's very beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I kid you not, I spent three hours yesterday on the first two notes <laughs> because you're re- <laughs> because you're really trying to relax. It's like the opening is like a sigh, it's a, uh, mm. and you've really got to bring that out through the music. Yeah. And you've got to phrase everything absolutely perfectly, and. I know as, as I get better and as I evolve as a musician, those sorts of things will become easier. But you have to really put the work in to try and figure out what, what good sound is. Mm-hmm. And most professional, most professional pianists, even the ones with truly incredible sound, sometimes do not know what it is. Even Rachmaninoff, greatest pianist of the 20th century, even he said that there, in some performers lies a divine spark Mm. which sometimes just can't be measured yeah (laughs) and that's what that's what sets that's what separates a great performer from a legendary one Mm. because there's there's just a there's just a tiny spark that makes all the difference which makes people sit there in complete and utter silence Mm. when you have when you have a really really great performer playing in a concert there's not a single cough ever oh yeah because because ever because everyone is so obsessed with like, being absolutely silent, being absolutely still. One of the best examples of this is Horowitz. There's a, there's a video of him playing a piece by Robert Schumann. Mm-hmm. It's, all about, it's, called the, it's called the Kinderzen. It's a, it's, a few, it's a selection of pieces based off childhood. And the very last one is called The Poet Speaks. Mm-hmm. And it's an absolutely gorgeous, very simple chorale-type piece. And at the very end, at the very last chord, he lets go. He lets go of the piano. There's silence for about a solid thirty seconds before people start applauding because they're just soaking in the sound that he created. Uh-huh. And it's and it's amazing 
And I, I genuinely, I would chop off my left foot to go see Horowitz live. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. So would you say that that's more talent or is that something that could be learned? It's definitely something that can be learned. There's, there's the debate of talent versus hard work is something that's, that definitely comes up. Mm -hmm. But I, like, I have a bit, I do, I will admit I have a bit of an ego. Oh. <laughs> I, I have quite a bit of I have quite a bit of an ego which push it, it pushes me onwards especially but I, I try and use it for good it pushes me onwards so whenever I see someone who's better than me I don't get intimidated because they're better than me I look at them and I'm like oh there's someone I can be better than in the future mm -hmm. that is that is how I use my incredibly overinflated ego to better myself yeah but the but going back to my point before I get sidetracked is the I'm not ashamed I'm not I'm not ashamed to say that I know I have talent I definitely have a degree of talent but it's also the amount of work that I've put in mm -hmm. and yeah. there is no there is no other way about it if someone says wow you're so talented I'm like yeah thank you but I want you to notice the work I've put in I want you to notice that over the summer over the last summer for about three months, I did eight hours every day because I wasn't happy with where I was at the end of the last academic year. Uh -huh. I want you to notice that I do four hours every day at the moment at an absolute minimum mm. because that, because I'm not where I want to be, because I want to be better than what I currently am. I want to be better than I am. I want to, tomorrow, by the end of tomorrow, every single day, I want to put a hand on heart and say I'm better than, I'm better than today than I was yesterday. And I try and do that for absolutely everything that I do. Oh. You, need to put, you need to be able to put your hand on your heart and say, I'm better than I was yesterday. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and I've lost my original point. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, a, that's very inspiring. It is. And it's also mm. very honest, I feel like, to just put your, like you said, <laughs> your hand on your heart and say, I'm better than I was yesterday. Progress. Yeah, you, yeah progress progress is absolutely everything you need to be able to continue moving forward whether you're taking like leaps whether you're taking leaps and bounds or whether you are crawling it doesn't matter whether you've got a mile or an inch mm -hmm. as long as you've gone forward that's what's important i think i remember what my original point was i was saying that the the whole point with the amount of hours of practice i put in is that summing summing everything up just the talent can be quite insulting because you are you're completely neglecting the sheer amount of work and hours that have been put into the perfection of the art. Mm -hmm. Like um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of debate with the musicians and how much musicians are paid and stuff like that. And you have a lot of people saying, "Oh, why why should I pay you? You're doing your music anyway. I'll give you the exposure." Because you're not paying for the musician's time then especially in times with things like string quartets for weddings, you're paying for all the hours of practice that they've done leading up to it. You're paying for part of their education. You're paying for all the time that they've spent in front of the instruments, mm -hmm. with the instruments, mastering and learning to be there to play for you at your wedding day. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. And regarding mm -hmm. virtuoso and reaching that point do you think it's plausible for every person with enough amount of work or do you feel like that's something that has to be more rooted in time with, with, to reach a sort to reach the level where you can say i'm a virtuoso pianist i i genuinely do think anyone could do it really mm. but the state the, the here's, here's the tricky bit the statement that anyone could do it is not the same as the statement anyone can do it Everyone has the same physical disposition to be able to do it. Not everyone has the right mindset to be able to do it. 99% mm. of the problems you will face, like even, even you in your journey whilst playing piano, will be mm. psychological. You will feel stuck. You will feel unable to progress. Mm. And that's what stops people. It's not because they physically can't do it. It's not because their hands aren't big enough. It's not because they can't quite do those jumps. Because with enough work, anyone can do anything, in my opinion. You will, be, you will be able to do it. But it's just about having the right mindset to do it. You have to have that determination. You have to have that willpower. You have to have that discipline. Mm -hmm. And that's what separates, that's what separates people. 
the only different talent makes in that regard is how much time it takes. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I've been I've been able to progress in four years, what has taken other people ten. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know that I've had discussions about that with people. There are people who are in the year above me in the who have been studying since they were five, mm-hmm. who I at least um, can hand on heart say I'm very close to if equal. To their playing ability. Wow. <laughs> that's all the that's all the difference that talent makes. With with talent, you can still go, you can still, you can still get very far. If you put in the hard work, you can go incredibly far. But if everyone put the hard work in to do one particular thing, mm-hmm. everyone would be able to do it. Yeah. How far do you want to go? Oh, I want to be the best. Uh-huh. <laughs> How would you measure that though? I would measure that by my favorite, my absolute favorite composer is Beethoven. Mm. Beethoven is my go to composer, he's my sort of inspiration. And my, my, my final dream, my final goal is I want to be the person that people say, if you want to, if you want to have a good be- interpretation of Beethoven or a good discussion of Beethoven, you go to him. Uh-huh. That, is how I, that is how I will measure my success. That is how I will know I have made it. Mm. It's the sort of thing you have to be, you have to know what you're, you have to know what you're planning to do. So I know that is my goal. I know that I need to do lots of work to get to that goal. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to do the work to get to that goal. And that is why I will get to that goal. Mm -hmm. That's a very solid point. (laughs) Definitely sounds like a plan. (laughs) Yeah. So what do you do with your music? What's your goal with it? I want to be a singer songwriter. I know it's very general, but that's the, <laughs> it's definitely not the classical direction. I don't think I could yeah. go there, but more of like contemporary. Hmm. Is like, have you thought about what exactly you need to do for that? Have you thought about what, uh, what technical level you need to be to do that? Yeah, um, <laughs> I probably should think about this a little bit more in depth. Um, I guess yeah. at this point, I just have to write a lot. Because with singer songwriter, I feel like it's very like adjacent almost. Because the more you sing, yeah. the more you're able to produce. If that makes sense, like originally. Yeah, I think a big thing that um, people need to bear in mind is that stuff takes time. You're not going to be in a master at something in a week. And I think this is where because I remember you put in your story. I think whether it was last week or maybe the week before that you, uh-huh. you hated practice. You absolutely <laughs> hated it. I can hand on heart say that for over half a year I have not felt that at all. I have loved every second I have practiced. Mm-hmm. Yes, I found yes, I found things hard, I found things frustrating, but I've always looked forward to getting back into the practice room the next day. Mm-hmm. And I think the reason the reason for that is because I can look so far ahead. I'm looking ahead, I'm not thinking, oh, in six months I want to do this. I'm thinking in five years, mm-hmm. this is where I'm going to be. In ten years, I'm going to be here. You need to think incredibly long term about stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And when you can think long term about stuff like that, and when you realize how far away, how much time you have, then you realize the progress you're making each day is completely and utterly worth it. Mm-hmm. You're, re- you're realizing that each day is a, is a step on a 10,000 mile journey, but each day you are making some steps, each day you're getting closer. But the point is never to give up because the instant you give up, the goals just gets further away and then you fall, you regress. Mm-hmm. And then you have feel, you, and then you feel, and then you feel even worse about the fact that you haven't started made progress to your goal because it feels so much further away. And then you get stuck in this incredibly dark loop mm-hmm. and, it's, and it can be virtually impossible to get out of it. Yeah. Have you heard of um, Navy SEALs? Yes. Do you know how they have Hell Week? Um, yeah. Yeah. So during it, I watched, I think my dad's like a big fan of watching videos about them. I don't know why, (laughs) but he always like talks about it to us. And he was saying how he watched a bunch of interviews and they all said that during the hell week, during all those challenges, they never once thought about giving up because as soon as they thought it, Mm. they knew they would. Yeah. It's, I, I would not be able to fathom giving up music. I just, I just can't fathom it. I do not know what I would do with myself because it's such a big part of who I am. Mm-hmm. 
So the, the, the idea of giving up is it's completely insane. I mean, I, I sort of have put all my eggs in one basket because I'm going, I'm going into the long haul. I'll go bigger, I go home, mm-hmm. very literally in this case. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's, the, it's, all about, it's all about the determination and the mindset that people need to have to get what they want to do. And it's, it's, it's to do with anything. I, I'm genuinely of the belief that regardless of who you are, regardless of what circumstances you have, the only obstacle stopping you from doing something is you. Mm. At the end of the day, if you want something, if you want something to work, you will do it. You will figure out a way to do it. You will move. You will move out of that terrible home. You'll move to a better neighbourhood. You will go to a nicer country. You will just go to somewhere you prefer to live. You will rise to stardom and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so the only question the only question is if you have that goal and you know what you need to do to get to that goal, are you doing something to get to that goal now? If not, why are you not? Mm-hmm. But I say this I say this a lot to, I say this a lot to my friends that are saying, oh well, Moss Summers, we want why aren't you practicing? Do you do you not want to be a top tier performer? And some of them don't, some of them just want to be good enough to be teachers. And that's mm-hmm. perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. And that's 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 perfectly fine. If that's their goal, that is where they want to be. That's mm. perfectly fine. And those who say yes, I want to be a good performer, they have to be willing to put that amount of work in to get to that position. Mm-hmm. That's a very good no excuses mindset. I like that. Mm. Oh, ab- absolutely, absolutely no excuses. I rem- I remember the uh, it was it was literally yesterday. I was left quite badly mm-hmm. and I didn't wake up until uh nearly 10 o'clock and I didn't get out of bed until 11 o'clock mm-hmm. <laughs> because I either I either sleep really well and I get up perfectly on time or I was sleep and sleep in four hours there was no in between <laughs> and I got absolutely awful because I booked practice rooms in the morning and I'd missed them both mm-hmm. because I don't slept and when Whenever something like that happens, I have to make up for myself. So, right, I missed two hours of practice rooms. So I have to do two hours of practice elsewhere. And to make up for that, I'm going to do another two hours afterwards as well. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, those, it's those scenarios where you leave, you leave completely drained and you leave feeling very frustrated and annoyed because maybe uh, the scenario of uh, diminishing returns sets in where no matter how long you sit, you're just getting less and less progress. But... Today I felt really good because it meant because it meant I went to bed last night saying, okay, that's not gonna happen again. It's not gonna happen tomorrow, it's not gonna happen the day after. And that is incredibly important. Because even when you fail, because you will fail, because everyone fails, everyone fails at some point. Even if you have a goal to wake up at six, six a.m., be up by six thirty, be gymming at be in the gym at seven every single morning, there will be a day, some day when you fail and you would and you will, because it happens to everyone. You're only human. Yeah. But when that does, it's important to go, okay, that happens. Anyway, carrying on. <laughs> yeah. Don't let don't let obstacles stop you. There's a, there was a, a good there was a good example of this in example where we do a class every Friday where we get to perform in front of each other. Mm-hmm. And one of my friends stopped, one of my friends started performing. Stopped started again got several things wrong and ended up not not feeling they felt absolutely terrible mm. <laughs> and you had they, they, they yeah they, they felt absolutely awful of course you feel bad for them you're, you're performing in front of people and that can be incredibly stressful but you have to remind them and i try to remind her that every single great performer ever will have had a moment where they'll feel perfectly embarrassed going on stage because something went badly wrong or they, they messed up a note or something the famous pianist who I mentioned earlier, Horowitz, he had a 12-year he had a 12-year absence from the concert stage. He didn't do a concert for 12 years. Oh my gosh. But when he came back, in the very first piece he played, the fifth note was wrong and very obviously wrong. Mm. But he continues to play the concert completely per- not perfectly, but very well. Because he had that, he obviously had that spark, you know, into enraptured audiences. But it didn't matter because no one cared that he got the fifth, the fifth note wrong because mm-hmm. he was still playing. 
it's why even when you stumble, you have to keep going. Never stop. Never, never, never get to what's the word I'm searching for. You never get too self-obsessed with your mistakes. Your mistakes happen. Great, they happen to everyone. Move on. Mm-hmm. Either do something. Either do something you can do to fix it, or move on. Mm-hmm. It's something sort of like I played. I played in that class this morning, and it was a very last. It was a very last minute decision because we needed to fill time. Teacher asked, "Does anyone have a quick piece I can play?" I was like, "Yeah, I'll play." Mm-hmm. And I played the piece completely awfully. Like. <laughs> I played. I played it so much better. There were wrong. There were wrong notes. Like uh-huh. Pedals wrong. Everything. Everything like that. People who I know who knew me best were like, "Yeah, he's definitely played that better." But then people who I don't know as well and who don't know the piece as well still said that the performance was really, really good. Mm-hmm. Because you have to keep going. You can't stop. Especially in music, quite literally, you can't stop performing. Mm-hmm. You just have to. Ca- you just. You just have to carry on. And I took that motto and just ran with it with everything in life. Mm-hmm. Regardless, of, regardless of what happens, you keep moving. It's like if you're, it's like if you're swimming. If you stop, if you stop, if, if you're swimming, you've got very heavy weights on. Which life can be sometimes. You have to keep moving. You have to keep swimming, otherwise you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think if that's if that's something to. Bash over, head, bash over people's heads. It's just keep, just keep moving. Because whatever your goal is, whether it's get into a certain university or get that certain job, you will do it if you put everything you have towards it. Mm-hmm. You will absolutely, you will absolutely do it. Mm-hmm. That's a very good point and an analogy to I feel like end this episode with. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. It was truly a very fascinating conversation. I feel like I learned a lot. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me on. Thank you very much for considering me uh, an interesting person. <laughs> <laughs> of course. 